Our title tonight is Downhill to Destruction. And this is the rest of the story, part eight. Say, how many parts is there going to be to this thing? I don't know yet. I don't know. But I know this. We're about to the prophets. Um, That'll be profitable. And never mind. So we're going to get to the prophets. And we're going to look at that. Who, Who recalls that... Uh, many of the prophets, when you read the opening line or opening verse of the prophets, it says, this guy is the son of whoever, and he prophesied in the days of this king, this king, and that king. Who remembers that? So a number of the prophets existed, and you're getting a head start, but a number of the prophets existed um, in the times of the kings that we are mentioning, we're talking about right now. And so their message to the people of Israel or the people of Judah um, that was being preached at that time, much, much of that message was written down in book form. This is how we get the written words of the prophet Isaiah, of Jeremiah, and others. And, and so while in our Bibles, canonically, okay, how our canon, all right, canon, the word canon means a measuring rod, um, this is the measure. This is uh, how we measure what we have. These are, this is how our Bible is laid out. This is how we have organized the Word of God we have, okay? Not our Chris Cannon, all right? Our Cannon. So canonically, how our Bible's arranged is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, the letter of the Romans, right? Um, let us sing the book of Moses, of Moses, right? And you go the the law and you go to all these things, Okay. Canonically, you have the law and you have the history, right? We've been we're on we're on the tail end of some of this history, and then you get into the prophets after that. Okay, you have the history, and after Kings, I think after Kings, you start to get into Ezra and Nehemiah. Those are historical books there, um, but before Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, chrono- chronologically, during the history we're looking at, some of these prophets over here. Okay, are you following the old? Are you following me? Am I like all over the place? So, if you picture the Old Testament from left to right, here's Genesis to Deuteronomy. Here's um, the historical books we've been looking at: uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, all these things. Here's the prophets over here. Okay, some of these prophets, these were written during the times that we're looking at right now. So as we get to the prophets next week, we're listening to messages that were preached during these times, okay? Now, that's significant because what you will notice as you get into what Jesus taught and what Jesus said about the future and his coming and the gathering, you're going to pick up on a lot of things that these prophets said during this time that they prophesied to the people of their day about coming destruction, but also about the future. And Jesus brought some of that to bear when he was teaching his disciples. Does that make sense? Does that kind of help for you? The backdrop of all this is important to understand. Okay, so before we get after this tonight, I want you to consider in your own life some things. And that is this. If you have repented and believed the gospel of Christ, You are in a relationship with God as your father, right? And nothing's ever going to change that. You're a child of God and nothing ever changes that. But he's a perfect father and he wants your best. And these stories are written for our example. And they're serious for us. And as a perfect and mature father, he wants us to live an obedient life of humility and submission to him. And that's the best way. So I want to ask you... Consider this tonight. Am I living in humble obedience to God? Uh, Children, Jack and Amelia and Lee and Kylie. If you can hear me back there, okay? Uh, Oh, she's over there, okay. Uh, Am I living in humble obedience to God? You know, Lee and Jack and Amelia, you know what that means? That I'm humbling myself, I'm submitting, I'm not proud. uh, I don't want to obey my parents, God. I'm submitting to God. I'm humbling myself. I'm obeying my parents. I'm obeying God. If, If you are a Christian, if you're saved, 
God's your father and he expects you to obey him. And the best way you can obey him now is by obeying your parents. So ask yourself tonight, am I humbly obeying God by humbly obeying my parents? But the same applies for you, adults. And the same applies for me when it comes to as a church member. I have a responsibility to other disciples and other believers to love you and serve you and bear your burdens. And am I living in humble obedience to God in which I'm deciding I want to be the child that God wants me to be in this family? Or am I, do I have my tunnel vision on and I'm the only child, I'm the only kid that's important, right? Am I in humble obedience to God? Uh, and you could apply that in all kinds of ways as an employee, Are you being the kind of employee that God wants you to be? And then, of course, I would ask, am I leading my family in that way? Am I leading my wife in that way? Am I leading my home in that way? Am I helping to lead my church that way? Am I exhorting others in the church to live in humble obedience to God? Hey, let's apply these things. Let's not just uh, leave the sermon at the front door or leave the Bible study at the front door of the church. Let's talk about this. Let's encourage each other. Let's be excited about these words. Am I, am I leading others to live this way? And here's the thing. Another One last thing I want you to consider as we get into this. Because I may live as I should, and you may live as you should, and we may live as we should, but we ask ourselves this. What can I expect in America, a country which seems to more and more reject God? What can I expect? Are there any patterns in nations that have rejected God? And so what can I expect? Of my nation, and how should that affect the way I live, the way I pray, the way I go about life? So, tonight, consider the downhill slide to destruction that happens in the lives of those who reject God. We're covering a large amount of time in the days of the kings that was a downhill slide to destruction. We started that this morning with King David and King Solomon. And we observed that though they were fine kings of Israel and the nation thrived because of God, they were men who sinned and faced consequences. And they were not the chosen one, the anointed one who would rule forever and crush the serpent's head. David, he committed adultery and murder. He dishonored the name of the God he loved and he brought years of untold hurt and pain to his family. Devastating were the consequences. Solomon started out great, but he loved many strange women and he cleaved in love to women that God said no to. And these women turn his heart away from the true God. He loved to worship other false gods. And he did evil on the side of the Lord. He built places in Israel where they could worship false gods. And he it, it's crazy, okay? It's like God revived the nation. The times of the judges were terrible. And they, they didn't get all the nations out. And they began to worship their gods. The, isn't it, This is mind-boggling. Do you see the big picture here? Here the nation is in the time of the judges after they forgot about Joshua and the generation and here's this generation that passed off the scene here's a generation on the scene that that has forgotten about God and is not obeying with him and they are intermarrying with the people of the land and following their gods and what do you find they're ensuing even good kings doing David and Solomon the very same thing it was common hat isn't that interesting to you it's interesting because often a nation's leaders will be a reflection of the people, won't it? Even the, even the good ones to a degree. But Solomon here, when he, his heart was led away into idolatry, he led the nation right back into the same old idolatry they were in when things got really messy in the times of the judges. Right back into it. And so pick up with me in the story. First Kings 11, look at verse 9. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my commandment and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. 
Notwithstanding, in thy days I will not do it. So while you're still alive, Solomon, I'm not going to do it. Why? For David thy father's sake. But I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. So in the days of Solomon's son, who would be king, God's saying, Solomon, I'm angry with you. And because you did not do what I told you to do, I'm going to rip the kingdom out of your son's hand. Look at verse 13. How be it, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David, my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. So what happens next, if you read this chapter, God stirred up adversaries to Solomon that gave him a, a hard time the, the rest of the time he was king. And then God got in touch with the servant that he told Solomon he would give his kingdom to. So remember, he said, I'm going to rend the kingdom from you. It's going to really going to happen to your son. And I'm going to give the kingdom to someone who serves you. Okay, look at verse 26. It says, And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and Ephrathite of Zerida, Zeretta, Solomon's servant, and it talks about his mother, and it talks about how he lifted up his hand against the king. And he goes on to explain why Jeroboam did that in the next few verses. And you find in verse 29, it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him in the way. And he had clad himself with a new garment. Jeroboam was wearing this nice new coat. And they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught a hold of his new garment that was on him. And he rent it into 12 pieces. Now that's, that was a mean move for a prophet. Next time I see one of you with a new jacket, watch out. I'm just kidding. Okay. So he did that. He tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take 10 pieces. For this is, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to thee. So this is the servant that the Lord was telling Solomon about that he was going to give the kingdom to. He said, I'm going to give ten tribes to you, Jeroboam. And then, of course, he acknowledged in verse 32 that he would give one tribe. Uh, he'd leave one tribe uh, with Solomon. And notice why, verse 33, because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped all these other gods here, verse 33, and they haven't walked in my ways, they haven't done what's right in my eyes, they haven't obeyed me as did David. And then he says in verse 34, hey, I'm not going to take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David, my servant's sake, whom I chose. Okay, so because of David and, and how he did do what was right in many ways, God was going to let Solomon f finish his life as a king. Look at verse 35. He said, but I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and I'm going to give it to you, even ten tribes. So he's telling Jeroboam the same thing he told Solomon. And to his son... Um, to Solomon's son, he's telling Jeroboam, I'm going to give one tribe, that David, my servant, may have a light all the way before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. And then he tells him in verse 37, I'm going to take you and you're going to reign and you're going to be king over Israel. And watch what he says in verse 38. It shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee and wilt walk in my ways and do that is right, in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, and build thee a sure house as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. And I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. So, because Solomon found out about this, of course, and he, he thought, I need to kill Jeroboam. <laughs> and so he tried to do that, and Jeroboam got out of there, and he went down to Egypt until the death of Solomon, and he could not do that. Well, Solomon eventually died, and then his son Rehoboam reigned in his place. And as you read about Rehoboam, um, on into chapter 12, uh, he, his foolish leadership led to a civil war, and he wouldn't listen to the people. But really what was going on, God was at work through his foolishness. It's amazing how what God says is going to happen is going to happen. He knows ahead of time. I don't believe that God is the cause of our foolishness, but he knows what we are. And he can organize things, and he can orchestrate things. He is powerful that way. Look at uh, verse 15 of chapter 12. This is talking about when Rehoboam, he didn't listen to the advice of the older men, and he's just making a fool of himself. And it says, Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord. 
that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake um, by that prophet to Jeroboam. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? We don't have anything here anymore. Solomon, his son, doesn't want to listen to us. We don't have any inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. See to your own house, David. We're done with you. And so Israel departed to their tents. And uh, it talks about here how Rehoboam continued to reign and how Rehoboam tried to enforce his rule on the rest of Israel and yet they rebelled un against him uh, unto the day of even this writing. And you get to verse 20, it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel, just like God had said. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. So the nation of Israel at this point split into two kingdoms. Okay? You had the northern kingdom consisting of ten tribes, and their capital would eventually be in Samaria. And you have the southern kingdom, which was consisting of Judah, and obviously their capital remained in Jerusalem. But notice how the northern kingdom and her king started, because the rest, the rest of um, kings here... You trace the kingdoms and the kings of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the history kind of goes like this. And then the northern kingdom is going to drop off, we'll see. And then the southern kingdom is going to drop off. Okay? And so what we need to understand, how did the northern kingdom and king get started? Okay, look at verse 25 of this chapter. This is after the ten tribes uh, of the north became Israel under Je Jeroboam. Jeroboam built Shechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein. And he went out from thence, he built another city. And he said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. He was concerned that the kingdom that he had received, they were going to go back to David. And why? Why was he concerned? Because he was concerned they'd go back to David because of the worship that they would want to go back and do in Jerusalem. That's where the temple was. That's where they went to worship God. He's thinking, if they go worship in Jerusalem, they're going to want the sons of David to rule over them. I need to do something about this. I need to invent a system of worship that keeps them here. Okay, so look at verse 27. And this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So what did the king do? He took counsel. He made two calves of gold. Now, the Bible reader at this point in the narrative is going to think two calves of gold. Why does this sound familiar? Well, when Moses was up on the mountain... And God was establishing his covenant with his people, saying, I'm going to rule you. I'm going to rule. Here are your laws. The people get frustrated and tired of waiting on Moses because people get tired of waiting on the man of God. Did you know that? They just do sometimes. And they get tired of waiting on Moses. And he comes down the mount. And there they are. They've made a golden calf that Aaron just took some gold and threw in the fire. And out came this calf. I don't know how it happened. And they're dancing. And they're immodest and all this stuff. And they're worshiping this calf they made saying, this is who brought you out of Egypt. And look how this has showed back up again. And the people of God, not faithful to God, but coming up with their own religion. And so he makes these calves. And he says to the people he rules, verse 28, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods. Can you imagine singing, behold your God to a tune like this in Israel? Sick. Behold your gods. Look at these calves of gold. It's not quite the same as the song we sing, is it? He says to them, behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. <laughs> and he set the one in Bethel, he put the other in Dan, and this thing became a sin. You're like, surprise, surprise. For the people went to worship before the one, even at Dan. And he made an house of high places. He made his own little temple. He made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. It didn't matter who they were or if they weren't qualified before God to serve in those temples. We're going to put them in there. 
And he ordained a feast in the eighth month. And on the fifteenth day of the month, like the feast in Judah, he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered on the altar in those places, even in the months which he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So out of the gate, Jeroboam is establishing his own system of worshiping these false gods that imitated and mimicked the worship of the true God, the feasts and the festivals and the sacrifices. It was a copycat, but it was fake. That's how they started. Well, the northern kingdom and her king started in idolatry, and they never recovered. They never recovered. They had 19 kings over the course of some 200 years, and not one of them. You know how you come to this king or that king, and it says he did evil in the sight of the Lord, or he did right in the sight of the Lord? Not one of their kings was it said he did right in the sight of the Lord. All of them did evil in the sight of the Lord. It's, of course, in the northern kingdom, we're introduced to the prophets during this period through Elijah and Elisha. These men of God who prophesied to the northern kingdom, these were prophets there and they prophesied to Israel, hey, judgment's coming because you've forsaken your God. And they, they did all these miracles. There's amazing miracles recorded about Elijah and then Elisha doubles the miracles demonstrating to the people that the Lord God was the only true and living God turned to him and they called the nation of Israel back to God, repent, come to God. They did these miracles which backed up their message, repent and come to God. It sounds like a prophet, capital P prophet, who would come and do miracles and call the nation back to God. But that's what they did. Elijah and Elisha were introduced to them in that time. Now, the southern kingdom did a little better. Okay, They had 19 kings and one queen over the course of some 340 years. And more than half of those kings and that queen, if not two-thirds, did evil in the sight of the Lord. More than half. They had their good kings who did right, but they never fully recovered from the idolatry Solomon had introduced to, Israel, to Judah, to Israel. In fact, in their relationship with the northern kingdom, which they kept, uh, there was conflict, but they sometimes tried to make peace, it introduced more idolatry to them down the road. And they never fully recovered from that. Over the years, they had a number of prophets, like I said, we'll introduce next week. But very simply tonight, I want to point out the downhill slide of Israel and Judah to destruction during this time. Now, I want you to think big picture. Okay? Genesis 1 through 11 deals with a select, the select group of people of Israel, or does it deal with the world as a whole, the nations as a whole? Which one? Nations as a whole, Genesis 1 through 11. It deals with the nations, God's work with humanity as a whole. And it's a downward spiral to what? Babel and judgment. Genesis 12 picks up the story as God focuses on Abraham and, the, and God's people on down and up to the end of their history in which they get ejected from the promised land. Where do they end up? Babylon. Isn't that interesting? So here's humanity. God blesses them. It starts out good. Downward spiral to Babel. Here's the people of God, the chosen people of Israel. God blesses them. It starts out good. Downward spiral to Babylon. Interesting stuff. If you want to be more familiar with the ins and outs of that history, again, I hit this again. again. Commit to a yearly Bible reading program. Take your time reading through this history. But go on over to 2 Kings chapter 17, please. 2 Kings 17. You're doing so well tonight. As you go there, I want to remind you of what God said through Moses, okay? He said that if they would obey and cleave to God, they would be blessed in the land. They had periods of time in which they were faithful to God and they were blessed. But if they disobeyed God and they forsook Him for idols, they would be cursed. God would devastate them with famines and diseases and pestilences and military defeats. He would pluck them out of the land and He would scatter them to the nations to worship gods made of earth and stone. Well, you get to 2 Kings 17, okay? It, talks, it begins with Ahaz, all right, and Judah, Hosea, 
in Samaria, Hoshea was the last king to reign over Israel. And of course, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He wasn't as bad as some of the kings, but he did evil enough. But watch what happened in verse 3. It says, Against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria. Hoshea became his servant and gave him presents. And you read on down throughout here and you find out how the king of Assyria over the course of the next few years began to besiege, lay siege around the city of Samaria. And it says in verse 6, in the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria, he took Samaria. He carried Israel away into Assyria. He carried the nation, the northern kingdom, away into captivity. Why? Verse 7, for so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, they feared other gods. They walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen to the fence city. They set them up images in groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them. And they wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, where the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets, by all the seers, saying, Turn, repent, do what I have told you to do. Do what I told your fathers to do. Do what I have told you by my servants, the prophets. But they would not hear, verse 14. They hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers. They that didn't believe the Lord their God. The, the fathers who God brought out of Egypt into the land, who hardened their necks, they were just like them. And they rejected, verse 15, they rejected God's ways. Middle of verse 15, they followed vanity. They became vain. They lived empty lives. They went after the heathen, the pagans, all about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. It's like they were the people of God who their prophets said, don't be like the world. And they said, we'll be like the world, not a big deal. That's what they were like. Verse 16, they left all the commandments of the Lord their God. They made them all these images and calves and worshipped all these false gods. Verse 17, they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire. They took their children and offered them in sacrifice on fiery altars to these false gods. They sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And so God was very angry with them. Verse 20 says he rejected all the seed of Israel. He afflicted them, delivered them into the hand of spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. He removed them. And so in the end of verse 23, it says, Israel was carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto, the, Assyria unto this day. And Israel was carted off into captivity in Assyria. About that time, Judah, they experienced revival as a nation under Hezekiah. Um, but Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, he was terrible. And he did evil in God's sight. Manasseh followed, so once the northern kingdom was removed, Manasseh in the southern kingdom, he'd followed all the trending abominations of the heathen that the Lord had cast out of Canaan. And though Hezekiah brought serious spiritual reform in Judah, Manasseh, he, he unreformed the reform. <laughs> and he introduced all these high places that his father had destroyed. He even built altars to false gods in God's temple. He even instituted child sacrifice to false gods, Manasseh did. And watch what God said about him. Go to chapter 21. We're nearing the end of this here. Chapter 21, verse 10. It says that in verse 10, The Lord spake by his servants the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I mean, look at this. This king, he's saying, this king, he did more evil in what he did than the people who lived in the land before Israel came. 
I mean, here's the end of the history of God's people in this land before captivity. And one of these last kings, Manasseh, one of these final kings, did more evil as a king of Judah than the nations that were in Judah or in the land that God sent Israel in to wipe out because of their sin. He did worse. You say, it doesn't, you're not, you're not going to be bad off to be like the world. I'm telling you, if the people of God say we can be like the world and be okay, you will end up worse than them in time. It's very scary. It's very scary. So God says, verse 11, because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these things above all that the Amorites did, verse 12, therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, behold, I am bringing such evil Upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. In other words, this is what I did to Samaria and Israel and Ahab for all their sin. And I'm going to take that standard of destruction and I'm going to apply it to Judah. And I will wipe, watch this end of verse 13. I'm going to wipe Jerusalem as a man wipes a dish. I'm going to wipe them clean and I'm going to turn it upside down and shake out the dust, clean them out. I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance, deliver them into the hand of their enemies. They shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done that which was evil in my sight, have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, beside his sin, wherewith he made due to the sin, and doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. How did he do? How did he shed much innocent blood? He killed their children and offered to these false gods. After Manasseh's grandson Josiah did right, experienced great revival, but after Josiah, all of Judah's kings were evil. You get to Jehoiakim, one of the last kings there, 2 Kings chapter 24, and the rest of Kings, 2 Kings that records Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon coming and, and laying siege to Jerusalem and carrying away all the treasures of the temple, carrying away all the people of Jerusalem and their elders and taking them all into captivity in Babylon. And that what you find is there was nothing left of the mighty chosen people of God. Their disobedience was a downhill to destruction. And that's what happened to these people. They did not honor the covenant of their God and he cursed them as he said he'd do generations ago. But remember his promise back in Deuteronomy 30. He promised from wherever I scatter you, if you will turn back to me with all of your heart and soul, I will gather you and bring you back and give you a new heart and one day he will. And so we need to recognize tonight the day has not yet come in which Israel has been gathered, restored, and renewed. One day that will happen, as Paul said in Romans 11, that all Israel shall shall be saved. At one point they rejected their anointed one, but one day they will see their Messiah and they will turn to him. A second thing you need to consider is America is not guaranteed to last forever. Manasseh ruled for some 55 years and killed a lot of innocent children. And how long has that been going on in America? Our God is just, and he has a very good memory. America is not going to last forever. God has made no covenant promises to the United States of America. He judges the nations with equity as he does with all. He is just. Nations that turn from God experience a downhill to destruction. And I want to ask again, how is America doing here? Are there opportunities for revival and renewal? Yes, there are, but we must be prepared for the worst and live for Christ in spite of the deteriorating condition of the United States of America. And the last thing I want to say is this. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you don't have to wait for God to gather you and give you a new heart. He already did. You don't have to wait for God to chasten you severely for you to wake up And live out this new life and this new heart that you have. He has given you a new heart and a new life. Your story, the story of this church, the story of your family, it does not have to be written like this was written. Because when you believe the gospel, God said, new heart for that person. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
And so I want to challenge us and encourage us to live out the new heart we have in Christ. We have it. So for us, it's not downhill to destruction, is it? It's uphill to utopia. Utopia.